I'm Bob, if you haven't figured that out of the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's been said for people in recovery that to get into a relationship is like putting fertilizer on your character defects. Um, and then one would have to say if that's true, and I believe it to be true, then why would it be true? And for me, my problems in relationships, which have been numerous, um, I actually had less problems with relationships when I was dealing drugs than I did sober. <laughs> Uh, I had a certain control mechanism that worked very well, and um, that was removed from me when I came into the program, and now I was just kind of left with the information I was raised with, and what I didn't know is most of it was really bad, and I had no concept of what a relationship was between two people, how it worked. I had no idea how two people talked to each other. I really had no idea it was okay to talk to your partner. I was raised by parents who uh, lived in silence. They did not speak to each other. There was um, never an argument in my house that I witnessed. There were plenty that I didn't witness and walked in on the energy of after it was over. But then um, being a classic um, alcoholic home, my father was the alcoholic. My mother was the one who, who liked that kind of excitement in her life. Um, <laughs> I'd come through the door and I'd catch all this incredible energy and, and, and I, and I, and, and it, you know, what's the matter? That's, I mean, that's the first words out of my mouth. What's the matter here? And the answer, of course, was the standard traditional uh, dysfunctional system answer. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing's the matter here. Which leaves me with one conclusion, and that conclusion is that there's something wrong with me. Because if mom says it's okay, and dad says it's okay, and I think there's something wrong, then the, the wrong, the wrong is here. The wrong is internal. The wrong is in me. And carrying that out in the world in relationships is just like dragging a boulder behind you. You know, if I don't trust my perception and I don't trust my intuitive process, then I'm just dead meat in a relationship because you will walk over me and take control of my life and dictate to me how I should behave and how I should dress. The interesting thing was that was not a situation when I was drinking and using it. It became a very big situation um, in recovery. Tina is Mrs. Earl number seven. <laughs> this, is, this is why I feel highly qualified to do a relationship workshop. I told Tina once, I said, you know, when I tell you you're a good wife, it means something. <laughs> <laughs> not just some idle observation made by someone with no experience. <laughs> this, is, this is truly a PhD in relationships. It costs more, too. My problems in relationships stem from my mother days of, you know, the Cleavers and Ozzy and Harriet and Father Knows Best and Rock Hudson and Doris Day. And this was the image that I got outside of my home. Inside my home, I had two messages, don't talk and don't have sex. That was basically my parents' relationship. <laughs> for the male, you just drink yourself into oblivion every night, which is my father's method. And for the woman, you just try and make nice for everybody all the time and don't let anyone know what you're doing and make sure that you keep up appearances, whatever they may be. My mother kept up appearances to this point. Um, we grew up, I grew up in Los Angeles in, a, in an apartment building over a couple of factories off of an alley. And my mother would go to take uh, photos to send home to the relatives back to Colorado and <clears throat> back east. And she'd take me down the street and up about a block to this house that had this great, big, beautiful bush of mums, these huge white flowers. And she'd take like a dozen pictures of me with a little uh, rectangle Kodak camera. And, and I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. And to this day, I hate having my picture taken. I mean, this is 50 years later. I still don't like having my picture taken because n once I got it that she was sending these pictures of this bush in this house to the relatives, and she, my mother would never say that she lived there. But it's implied <laughs> that, that's, that she took me out in front of our cute little house with the bush instead of this uh, piece of shit apartment we lived in. <laughs> and... Um, were no room for me. I slept on the couch, you know. So a lot of the messages that I got early on were the messages that I carried into relationships with me. One was having grown up um, in, without a room 
when I became a single male, I could never have a one-bedroom apartment. Um, of course, there's always the paranoia of the of the narcotics that they do increase it. But I I couldn't I could not stand being in that bedroom in an apartment alone and not knowing what the hell was going on in the rest of the apartment because I had always grown up on the couch in the living room. So I'd get single apartments where I'd have my bed in the living room and then the kitchen and the bathroom, and I'm very comfortable in that kind of an apartment. It took me years, probably about, oh, God, I guess 15 years in recovery before I got a one-bedroom apartment, before I finally got a one. Now, if I have a partner, I can have a one-bedroom apartment, a two-bedroom apartment, a five-bedroom house. That doesn't matter. Well, if I'm there alone, uh, that's, that's not, uh, that's not a, a comfortable thing for me. One of the things I discovered is not only did I have this bad information, like, see, you know, I went into relationships and recovery thinking that it was going to be Doris Day and Rock Hudson and wound up, you know, um, Michael Douglas and, and Sharon Stone, you know, <laughs> <laughs> with the net knife under the bed, you know, or, or, or Michael Douglas and Glenn Close, you know, I love you. Hey! <laughs> I'm going to destroy your life. I kept picking those. <laughs> But they kept the excitement quotient up. <laughs> One of the things that I learned about relationships, and this is a long, painful journey, what made it hard for me in recovery was nobody was talking about this stuff. Basically, I grew up in, in an AA program that said, your sobriety comes first at all costs, and if anything makes you uncomfortable, get rid of it. <laughs> Hence, Mrs. Earl number seven, you know. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was a philosophy I took to, um, <laughs> made good sense to me, and I operated on it from the very beginning. But there was never anybody talking about confronting things or talking about things or working things out, and I didn't have any realistic knowledge about men or women or sex or anything else, you know. It was all... You get the stuff either from mom and dad or the schoolyard or for TV or movies. I just attended a brilliant workshop in London. This woman did a thing for women, and I, I went because um, I've got a daughter, on fairy tales. She's a psychologist, and she did this thing with this room full of women, about 100 women on fairy tales, and she started to question them about Cinderella. Did you ever see the story? Did you ever dissect the story? Did you ever get the message? Did you really ever believe? I bet 80 of the 100 women stuck their hand up that they honest to God believed one day the prince was going to come along. <laughs> <laughs> they grew up believing there was a prince. Not only did they believe there was a prince, they believed all, what did, what did Cinderella have to do in order to have a happy life with the prince? The right size foot. <laughs> This is the only requirement. <laughs> Other than the prince, there are no men in Cinderella. Cinderella does not have a mommy and daddy. Most fairy tales have the evil stepmother in it. And, in, and the other one. So she was doing this workshop with these women and saying, listening to this thing, these are the women I married. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> they looked at me and saw a prince. I looked at them and saw a princess. And that had nothing to do with what was going on emotionally, um, inside. And, and I see that in recovery a lot. You know, we spot each other across the room and, I mean, you know, like the, mo the motors start to run and, you know, you can just hear the jet engine crank up. <laughs> and you just kind of slide across the room and say, hi, I want to go for coffee. <laughs> Having no, no idea what the hell we're getting into. And I look across the room and I see her. I see the woman I have looked for all my life. I see the woman that's going to make me complete. I see the woman that's going to make my life complete. It's going to validate me as a man. I see the woman that's finally going to take the pressure off of me. She sees, and so in essence what I'm saying is I see mom. Mom, hi. I'll be there in a minute. And, 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 and she sees this knight in shining armor on a horse with a glass slipper and knows that her foot fits. And then all she has to do is put her foot in the slipper and everything is going to be okay. And she doesn't understand, I need her to take care of me. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> no one has ever taken care of me. I need this woman to take care of me. I need her to be obedient. And above all, because I am a battered child, 
from a, I mean a, um, a, a severely um, a physical woman. Um, I, above all, you can't, I also need you never to get mad at me. Absolutely not. Under any circumstances can you get mad at me. So this is only part of the baggage that I bring into a relationship. I come into a relationship with another human being, and, and it's like absolutely mandatory that you may not get mad at me. Now, I don't tell you that. <laughs> okay. I don't have any communication skills. I'm not going to tell you that, because if I tell you that, you might get mad. Okay. So, so if you're worried about making your partner mad, like I was worried about making my partner mad, it really limits your conversation to <laughs> bullshit. You know, the, the weather and Snoopy cartoon strips and, uh, and whatever else, but it's never got anything to do with what's really going on because I am absolutely terrified of an overtly angry woman. And I bring that into a relationship. I don't tell you about it. I don't talk about it. I just bring it in the door with me. And I also bring in the door a, a, a pathology that goes with that that borders almost on madness. Because the other side of my own personal pathology is, four years clean and sober, it's conceivable you could have found me standing in the middle of your hood in an intersection trying to discuss your driving with you. <laughs> so, on one hand, I'm standing in the intersection saying the guy's twice my size, <laughs> don't talk to me. Let's just fucking do it, right? And yet, if a woman had got out of the car, I had been down the street, backing up, apologizing, begging forgiveness, you know, whatever. And so I come into a relationship with a woman, and I've got this madness in my mind. I mean, this is what goes on in recovering relationships. We bring all this baggage in. I was sexually molested, not just, you know, some inappropriate fondling in the tub by my mother. It leaves serious consequences. But I don't know what they are because no one talked to me about it. It was never acknowledged that anything was wrong in my house. When I reacted, like, oh, ooh, that's not good, I was just told to shut up, you know, or I'm going to get murdered for it. So I, I enter into relationships. I'm in beginning in recovery. I love to um, uh, uh, slide up next to um, sexually aggressive women. But hi. <laughs> I can tell you just are wonderful. Let's go. <clears throat> and we would run off down the road and be together for a while, a week, two weeks, a month, whatever it would be. And then at one point, we would be laying somewhere quietly, side by side, nothing going on. And they would do exactly what the hell I had picked them to do. I picked them to be sexually aggressive, and they would be sexually aggressive. They would reach over and begin to fondle. The minute this woman touched me, inside, I would go into a rage bordering on homicidal. I wanted to smash her bone. Now, I don't do this, and I don't react to this, and I don't say anything, and I lay there, and I slip off into fantasy so I can manage to come up with an erection to perform for this woman, and we get it over and we get it done with, but I think she should die. Now, I'm left sober trying to figure all this crap out, right? You know, saying, well, where do you go to your sponsor with this? Not, not when my days when I was sober, they were having the same goddamn problems, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> so they didn't want it drawn, you know, anybody bringing it to their attention. Um... I can't stand for anybody to spend, for a, a partner of mine to spend a long period of time in a bathroom. Drives me complete. I mean, I get crazy, like a caged animal. I pace the room. I get just berserk. I could never figure this out until I finally plugged into the, some of the inappropriate stuff that went on in the bathroom with my mom. And then I got, I mean, I remember I was, I, I was, um, I think it was Lori, I bought an incredibly expensive antique makeup table just to get her the hell out of the bathroom. <laughs> in the bedroom so she stopped spending so much time and i and i'm like nuts with this stuff and this basically is the undercurrent that was going on all of my recovery and relationships and not only that i have no i had at that time no skills for grieving none i've now come to really get it that the end of anything the end of anything is the tears that's the end and that grieving is a very healthy, natural, necessary healing process. In order to say goodbye to the old so I can say hello to the new, I must be able to grieve the loss of whatever it is, residence, job, 
parent, child, it doesn't matter, lover, wife, I must be able to say goodbye. I must be able to say goodbye. I didn't have that skill. And an interesting dynamic, it, it seems, exists. If you, if you cannot say goodbye to your past partners, they're with you <laughs> forever. <laughs> so <clears throat> I was just kind of bringing all these women with me through life. So I would show up at your apartment for a date, and I'd knock on the door, and you open the door, and I've got 13 women standing in the hallway behind me, you know. I mean, it would have been more honest if I said, I hope you have a very large bed, darling, because there's a lot of people coming along. <clears throat> because I haven't been able to say goodbye to any of them. And I don't know how. I don't have that skill. My family didn't have that skill. I literally, I swear to God, I came from a family in which no one died. I have uncles that have been on trips for 80 years. They've been gone. But no one died in my family. No one acknowledged death. Nobody talked about death. Death just didn't exist. So grieving is not a skill I have. Crying and saying goodbye is not a skill that belongs to me. It's not a skill I bring into a relationship. Well, when you bring all these other people with you, they're always there talking, criticizing. They're all those memories. And I was so um, unskilled in the area of love and emotion. You see, if I can't grieve, then I don't want you to grieve because I don't understand your grieving. So I'd be in a relationship with a woman and she'd have a moment where she would have some memories over the past relationship that had gone and some sadness over the fact that it was over. Because no matter how terrible a relationship was, there's pretty good odds there were moments that were good. And it's those moments that need to be grieved and cried over and said goodbye to. And so I would be with someone and they would hit this moment of grieving. They, they really, honest to God, have sadness that this person is now gone from their life and they miss them and there's some tears and there's a saying goodbye process. I was never able to allow a woman in a relationship with me to grieve the loss of an old lover. I don't have the skill, I don't understand the skill, and it becomes a threat to me. I believe if you have feelings still for that person behind me, you can't possibly have feelings for me. Because, see, I'm so locked down in the feeling department, I don't have these skills, so I don't know that I can have feelings for someone gone, and I can cry tears for them, and still just love you completely and, and beyond um, any comprehension, really, the amount of love that I can have. So <clears throat> I'm in relationships. I don't want to make women mad. I'm carrying the sexual baggage from my mother. I'm <laughs> I have brought 13, 14, 15 other women with me into the relationship because I haven't been able to say goodbye to them. I cannot allow you to grieve or say goodbye to any of your old lovers. And other than this, it's pretty okay around the house. You know what I mean? It's not... Uh, uh, <laughs> As long as we keep busy, we're okay. You know, lots of meetings, lots of conventions, lots of movies, lots of stuff. Lots of, as long as we're busy, we're okay. It gets tough at those moments at home when there's nothing on the TV set to drug out with and there's nothing going on and there's just you and there's me and I don't know what to do. I do not know what to do. And one of the other things I learned about you know, being a partner in a relationship means being supportive and caring. And sometimes your mate will get sick. And I, um, for years, probably part of it was because I worked on an ambulance during part of my drug addiction, but um, <laughs> I'm a good caretaker. I mean, I can take good custodial care of a partner. If you get sick, I'm real good about calling the doctor, getting the prescriptions, picking up the medicines, going and getting the juice at the market, Whatever you need, you know, getting the better pillow or the thing or the fan or the humidifier. I'm really good, man. I can get out there and hustle and gather that stuff together and call those people and make it happen and come home and make sure you get your medication on time and you got the right juice to drink and the thing and to mix the thing and to do the thing. But if you look up from that bed for some sort of emotional support, it's not there. It's not there. I never received it and I don't know how to give it. It's very, very difficult for me. One of the things that finally happened for me <clears throat> that changed the relationship um, scene for me forever, I used to um, 
there's a there's a there's an there's an element that is is um, inherent in people who are um, shame based. Basically, you are ashamed of who you believe yourself to be, uh, and that element is this: we will then live our life. If I'm ashamed of what I believe is in here, then I will get out of here, and I will live my life focused outside. So I've always been convinced that all my answers were going to come to me from external, because it was inconceivable to me that anything good could come from in here, that anything good could come from inside of me. It has to come from outside. So uh, that's another element in a relationship. It takes on an in, an re, unrealistic importance in my life. Your appearance, how you behave, how you talk, how you walk, how you dress, what you do is a reflection on me. See? I don't get it. It's got nothing to do with me. You know, I didn't have that skill then. I, I, and so I was very um, um, vigilant, hyper-vigilant over, over you and how you dressed and what you did. And, 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 and because I didn't want to make you mad, I could never really come out and say, Jesus, that's an awful-looking shirt. I, I, it, all, it, it always came out sideways, you know. God, I really like the pink blouse. You know, I think a little more color maybe where we're going would be nice. Anything but say I hate that shirt, see? Because I hate that shirt to me is setting up, setting it up for uh, an argument, and I don't want to have an argument. I don't want to be involved in an argument. I don't want to create a, a situation in which you can come after me. Um, what else? Basically, the relationship um, area changed for me. I was going to say when Taylor died, but I don't think. Oh, I know what I said. The point I was trying to make was this. Over the years, I mean, every wife was not identical. They are as different externally as night and day. They are as different externally as night and day. Because I knew I kept waking up with emotionally the same person, cold, unavail unavailable, um, angry, um, repressed, though. I mean, it was critical that your anger be repressed. You know, I... I um, <laughs> That's, that's a turn on. See, if I can meet a woman who's got a lot of repressed hostility towards men, this is very exciting because I have a lot of repressed hostility towards women. And this hostility usually will come out sexually. So in, under the guise of, well, I've had a few wake-up calls. I think the biggest was from my therapist. 17 years sober, I finally found her. Um, this was a meat grinder. I was literally... <laughs> I literally got the one I'd been afraid of all my life. <clears throat> I have no idea how I did it, but I did it. I guess it was just for my healing. You know, God said, well, Bob, I've given you all these really nice people. It, ha it hasn't worked. <laughs> and I have someone who needs to work through a lot of stuff, so I'll put the two of you together. <clears throat> and um, God did. And I, honest to God, it was. It was like walking into a moving airplane propeller. This woman was perpetually angry. And if I thought I was hypervigilant, this woman took it to space age uh, levels of, of just everything I did. Nothing was okay. You know, she, had, she had to redress me. She didn't like my car. I mean, we, I had to move. I had a lovely penthouse at the beach. We had to move to a house in Beverly Hills. And I was unwilling to do some of this stuff because I, by now I'm 17 years sober. I've learned a little bit. I'm feeling a little better. So she would maneuver and manipulate me into it, and she'd set up situations that she knew would work. That's the only skill she had. One, <clears throat> and one thing I absolutely abhor more than anything else in the world is public scenes. I'm an old dope fiend dealer out of the 50s. I like shadows and dark and quiet, you know? Nobody was putting cocaine up their nose in the 50s. If you put a man's cocaine in your nose in the 50s, he would have broke your goddamn nose for wasting good injectable, you know, substances, okay? So I didn't move in the lights and the music and all the, you know, fast track. I moved in the shadows. My, my life was a shadow life. Right. Don't know what the hell that's all about. <laughs> Where was I? I, I was having so much fun. <laughs> I, I lost myself. <laughs> Public scene. So, this girl would wait until we would be out in some small, intimate French 
Beverly Hills Cafe where the tables are six inches apart <laughs> and get me. So I had, I think, um, my favorite was I had a 77 um, Cadillac Seville, which I really loved, but it was three years old. And I was going to get rid of it. And I wanted a Corvette, you know, because by now my adolescence is coming alive inside of me and wants a Corvette. And so I figure, you can have a Corvette. I'll get you a Corvette. And I say to my, my, my live-in lover, I'll, she who had a, a, a piece of shit Datsun, I'll give you the, the Cadillac, you know. And she says to me, no, no, no. No, no, you'll spend the same amount of money on a car for me um, that you spend on yourself. She was very vigilant about being taken advantage of in her mind. <laughs> My just breathing was actually taking air out of her space. <laughs> <laughs> At that time in her life. So she would wait until we'd be out somewhere and we'd get dinner ordered and everything would be quiet. And then this voice would come across the table at me. It was a person that possessed her, I realize now. Because <laughs> we really came around to, to be good friends, and she did a, a 180 with a lot of stuff. But she stuck with her own therapy. And stuff. But anyway, at this point, it wasn't working. And um, she'd say to me across the table in a really loud voice, she'd say, I do not know how it's possible for you to tell me you love me and mean it when you won't spend the same money on a car for me that you spend on you. <laughs> Forty other fucking people in the restaurant are all, you know, <laughs> looking to see who is this asshole who won't buy her a, you know. <laughs> she got the goddamn Mercedes, which was what she wanted in the, she wanted in the first place. She eventually wound up paying it off herself, which I thought was great. She came to me long after we were separated, and she said, it's time for me to pay for my own things, and I'm a big girl, even though a cohabitation agreement had said I would pay off the car. She said, I need to do this for my own recovery. And, and you know, we had a, a beautiful talk to it. But anyway, in this relationship, it was just destroying me, mostly because of the anger. I was so afraid of the anger. So I finally went into therapy. It was the only alternative left to me. I was 17 years clean and sober. I had done the steps. I had done tons of service work. I had written 32 goddamn inventories. I, by that time, I had been through five wives. I, relationships were really bothering me. I'm now hooked into this woman who's working her own stuff out, and unfortunately, it's on me that it's being worked out on. So, so I mean, I'm glad she worked it out. But, And if I had to get really, really honest, I am extremely, extremely grateful to her because she is the emotional situation in my life that kicked my ass into therapy. And without it, I don't know that I'd be here today, or if I'd be here, I'd be really full of shit. You know, I'd be one more um, old-timer quoting um, uh, the, the sayings and uh, telling you to work the next step and don't think about that stuff in your past because it's not important, <clears throat> which I know better now. So I'm in this therapy with this woman, and... Um, after a while, I can't remember how long, but it was a while, and I, we were, I was going like three to five days a week, because by then I was nuts. I mean, we're talking bananas. <clears throat> and one day I said to her, I said, by the way, where are we going with this? You know, where, where are we going with this? No sense asking in front, just to ask later after you've already got a lot of investment. She said, we're going to go to a place in time, you and I, where you will experience your sexuality and tenderness in the same instant. And I got real quiet, and I sat there. And she let me sit there for a long time. You know how they do. They just let you sit there for a long time. And then she asked that infamous question that they take a full year of schooling to get the right tone. How does that make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> And I looked there and I said, well, the first thought that came to mind is that I may never get another erection again as long as I live. <laughs> and the second thought that came to mind is all of the broken beds and destroyed chairs and dented in automobile hoods and plaster knocked out of walls with people's heads and rug burns all over people's bodies was not in fact fashion, but it was in fact anger. 
it was anger. And the guys making love, we were really hurting each other physically because both of whoever I picked and myself had this well of undercurrent of anger and it was just there, just tearing us apart. Well, now my therapist starts to give me the skill to be able to get in touch with what I'm feeling, which is brand new to me. And then what she wants me to be able to do is go home and express this to another person. I like this idea. This, this in a relationship starts to make sense. I begin to understand people should talk to each other. I mean, I'm getting it now because I'm talking to this woman. I'm talking to this woman in her office, day in, day out, hour after hour, and good things are happening. I'm starting to feel better. I'm starting to get okay with the fact that I'm not okay. I'm starting to understand I don't have to spend my life pretending like I'm all right. I can let you see some sides of me that say that I'm not okay. So if I go home one day and I say to this girl, look, I want you to know that you walk around this house all day long with this angry expression on your face and it scares me. It makes me afraid. This felt good. Communication. You're doing this. This is how it makes me feel. All right. I like it. But then she turns around and says, listen, if you woke up every morning next to a cold, distant, emotionally unavailable male, you'd walk around with an angry face all day, too. <laughs> well, I didn't really want to hear that shit. It seems unfair, you know? It seems like you should get a year in which they cannot answer, you know? <laughs> that... <clears throat> Because <laughs> if you answer me like that, then my codependency kicks in, which says, now I've done something wrong and I have to fix it and I'm responsible for how you feel, so what do I do to make it better? You know? I mean, it was like, so it didn't work well at the beginning. We, we tried to talk, but it just didn't work well. We also threw a lot of water on each other in the beginning. <laughs> trying to talk into each other's face, I believe, would be exactly <laughs> where it went. But eventually, eventually, I got to the point where I could sit down and say, this is who I am, and this is what I'm feeling. But I didn't have those skills early on in my life. One of the things, if you want to get a fix on relationship stuff, you might want to inventory at some point, and I, can, I, I suggest this to all adult children, period, but it's just the dinner table. Just go back and take a nice, thorough, written inventory of mealtime in your family. Because in most homes, it's pretty bad. In, in, in some homes, it's just the tension. It's tremendous tension, particularly heaps on the children to behave other than childlike at the table. My house, well, this is worth telling my house, uh, my father's dissatisfaction with my mother's cooking was simple. It would just, whatever it was, I'd watch it go by <laughs> on its way to the wall. He never said anything. He just threw it against the wall and would go to bed. He would not get violent with her, wouldn't scream, wouldn't yell, wouldn't shout. He'd just throw the food. Okay. To let you know, I, see, I'm convinced now at this point in my recovery that what we, the hook we have in relationships is this one. We are addicted to people who will recreate the energy that's familiar to us. Um, Pat O'Gorman talks about it when she says adult children will spend their entire adult lives. <laughs> now you can hear on um, the other side of this. Yeah. pain. I will be pulled to you if you will recreate for me the energy of my childhood. Well, that means basically what I'm saying is I'm going to find women who somehow, at some level, still are my mom. That's disgusting. I've always found that disgusting. Even though it's true, I find it disgusting. My mother had well, was a bad cook, by the way, really an awful cook. <laughs> <laughs> so my father had a lot of ammunition for... Uh, but I didn't know this. See, I'm a kid growing up in this house. I don't know this because I don't eat out for, until I'm 15 years old. I think I was 14 years old. I eat out and I really get it. <laughs> but my mother's a shit cook because, you know, <laughs> I had some meatloaf in a coffee shop in Los Angeles and it was great. It was, I mean, I couldn't, but my mother would take an eggplant and slice it, take a slice, put Crisco in a skillet, 
throw the slice of eggplant in the skillet and fry it and serve it. Forget seasoning, salt, pepper, just Crisco and eggplant. Needless to say, I didn't eat eggplant for a lot of, year, a lot of years. And uh, unfortunately for me, I grew up in a house where the rule was this. This is dinner. Eat it. But if you don't want to eat it, you don't have to. However, it will be there at breakfast. <laughs> and if you don't eat it at breakfast, it will be there at lunch. And if you don't eat it at lunch, it will be there at dinner tomorrow night. But before you eat again, you will eat this. So no matter how terrible it was what my mother fixed, it was edible to me. One of her dishes that she loved was a tuna fish and lima bean casserole. <laughs> I honest to God don't think I'd put tuna fish and lima beans together if they were the last two things in the house, <laughs> you know? But, <clears throat> but for some reason, she liked this casserole. I hated this casserole. She knew I hated this casserole, but it was one my father would eat. So I got it a lot. Uh, to tell you the depth of this, at 18 years of age, I leave California running like a son of a bitch from the law because they've just instilled the secret indictment um, system in the, in the courts, which means you're under arrest and you don't know it. You're walking the streets and you don't even know. You're already indicted, and they can just come snatch you any time they want. And friends of mine were disappearing quickly. <clears throat> so, I, I mean, and there's no big deal about it. It's not like they bust anything. It's just one day you're walking down the street, and they just slide up next to you and scoop you up, and you're gone. So there's no conversation in the grapevine. Where's Fred? Fuck, I don't know. Did you see him? No, I didn't see him. Did you see him? No, I didn't see him. I have shit, he's gone. Fred's gone. Then Bill's gone. Then Harry's gone. Rocky's gone. You know, and I left the state. I just got the message. <laughs> so I go to Colorado. In Colorado, I meet this girl from Nebraska. We set up housekeeping, and then because she's nervous about her father finding out this farm family in Nebraska, that we are living together and not married, she gets really anxious about getting married, almost to the point of anger, which of course, at that point, I said, sure, let's get married. Why? <laughs> it's okay with me. We get married. First night in our apartment, she fixes me a wedding night dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Want to guess what it was? I had to go 1,500 miles to find her, but I found her. She prepared tuna fish and lima bean casserole. <laughs> But now I have a skill. I know what to do with it. I don't have to eat it, and I don't have to talk to her. I just pick it up and plaster the wall with it. This is her introduction to her new husband. That and the feds were at the door 15 minutes later wanting to have a conversation. So here's this farm girl from Nebraska is tied into me, and she was thrilled. I mean, it gave her life the excitement that she wanted, you know? How could it have been handled differently? Well, if I'd had some skills and known what was going on, the minute she put this tuna fish casserole down in front of me, see, my, my favorite definition of intimacy is me being me and letting you see me. That's it. That's all intimacy really is. Me being me and letting you see me. It doesn't even require that you participate. There's tens of thousands of people running around looking for someone to be intimate with. Just be intimate with who you're with, and you'll get a real quick fix on what you got going. Let them see who you really are and see what kind of reaction you get. So if I'd had these skills when this woman placed this casserole in front of me, I could have said, whoa, hmm. we need to talk for a minute. There's a small problem here. Um, I hate tuna fish and lima bean casseroles, and my mother knew I hated tuna fish and lima bean casseroles, but she prepared them for me anyway. And now that you've prepared this, you see, I really believe that my mother was incapable of loving me. It was not something she could do. And so I believe that's what allowed her and enabled her to prepare for me, her child, this dish that she knew I hated. And so when you fix me this dish, my immediate reaction to this dish is that you don't love me. And that scares me. What's a hell of a lot of difference in picking it up and throwing it against the wall? But I didn't have that skill. So I find that 
the biggest relationship problem most people I have encountered in working with people in recovery is the baggage we bring into it. It's not the person that we've picked, it's the stuff we bring, you know. The person we pick is compatible to work out whatever the hell it is we need to work out. If we're lucky, we'll both keep working stuff out and we'll go on down the road together. If we aren't, we won't. There's a big tendency in, in people in recovery to, to suffer a lot of emotional pain in relationships based on either trying to drag people into their life before it's time for them to come or, or, or trying to keep them in when it's time for them to get out, you know, that we can't let that process take place. To assume that we should be able to walk in, most of us, with the history that we have, to assume that we should be able to walk into a relationship and have it be the Cleavers or Ozzy and Harriet or, or whoever, you know, Doris Day and Rock Hudson, is complete insanity. Complete, absolute insanity. I don't have the skills. I've got tons of baggage. I'm bringing wounds with me that have not yet been acknowledged or felt or dealt with or healed. i got more stuff than any five people should carry and you are conveniently going to be my target. I don't want it this way. I don't plan it this way. I don't. When I look at a beautiful woman across the room in those days and I saw her, I mean, I didn't see a bullseye on her chest. You know, it wasn't like, oh, boy, let's get this one. It was a princess. It was a princess. It was somebody who was going to make me okay. And one of the first skills I think that a person needs in a relationship is the ability to trust your, to, to trust your intuition. One of the things that I love about the adult-child recovery process is that the intu the, our intuition is still perfect. My intuition is as good as the day God dropped me on the planet when it was absolute perfect. When my radar was perfect and everything was perfect, it's still that good. My problem is not how good it is. My problem is that I don't listen to it because I was taught very early on as a child that what I felt was not valid. I mean, it can be down to stuff as simple as a parent spinning on you and saying, you don't have to go to the bathroom. And you sit there and go, oh, okay. If that's not it, what is it? But it's that you don't, I mean, my God, in, in, in six trips down the aisle, do you not think on more than one occasion a little voice inside of me said, Bob, this is not a good idea what you're about to do. Of course it did. Did I listen? No. Because I say to the little old voice, shut up. You don't get it. This is a beautiful woman. I'm incomplete without a woman. Now, and as soon as I marry her, we're together. I'm okay. You get it? So shut up. And I'd walk up quietly and say I do and take the next wife on. And begin the same process all over again. And it would end the same way every time. I begin to become afraid of your anger, and I had two skills given to me by my father to get rid of you. I would shut you off sexually and stop talking to you. And you got a choice at some point. Kill yourself or leave. And all the women I was dating and married to were in recovery, so they had sponsors to point it out to them. It is not worth killing yourself over him. <laughs> <laughs> and they would leave, which is what I wanted them to do in the first place. Go away because I'm done. I'm out of skills. I can't take this relationship one inch further because I don't know what to do. For Tina and I, in the beginning, as we were moving, and we've been married seven years now, it's absolute earth-shattering record for me. <laughs> About 18 months to two years was the max anywhere in there. So we constantly found ourselves nervous, afraid, and uncomfortable. And the reason we kept finding ourselves in that position is we kept moving the relationship into areas that we had not experienced before. And we began to understand that to, for us to be comfortable was dangerous, was really dangerous. Because if I'm real comfortable... It means I'm into old stuff. I'm into the stuff I know how to say, what to do. I know the dance. If I'm doing the comfortable dance, 
we are in trouble. If I'm a little not sure where to put my feet, and i got to say, you know what, team God, I'm not sure what to do about this. And she can say, I'm not either, and we can figure it out together. Things we had to do, we had to make ground rules for ourselves so we could talk to each other. <clears throat> her, both her parents were alcoholics and ragers, yellers, screamers. I'm terrified I was beaten as a child, so we had to make a deal. The deal is this. Neither one of us will ever, ever, under any circumstances, leave the other one while angry. Ah, well, what does that give me? It gives me freedom to make her mad. I can come up to her and say things to her that I know are going to make her mad. Wow. Can you imagine what a freedom that is for me? I mean, to be such a prisoner for so many years of being terrified of the overt anger of women to finally be able to sit down and say something to a woman that I know before I even say it's going to piss her off and then be able to sit there and stay there and, and, and work through it and talk through it as awful as it is and as uncomfortable as it is as much as I like to get under the chair as much as I would like to die often when we have to have these kind of discussions we go for a walk we find it's just real good to get out away from all our stuff you know, and be out and walk and then just talk. And we also have no rules when we need to have these talks. We have the, we're going to vomit it out now and clean it up later. So it's not so much when you do this, I feel. It's, <laughs> God damn it, what the fuck are you doing with that? <laughs> and then once we get that out, we come back and clean it up and own our stuff. And because and, and, we're just not, I haven't been doing that when you, I feel, for 58 years. I've been locked down for, you know, most of it. So I, it's not, I'm, it's a skill I'm getting, but it doesn't come naturally, you know. Homicide becomes first. It's the first thing that appears. Is where is the goddamn gun, you know, and we can discuss this. <clears throat> um, the other side of it that I see, which we're blessed because we have a little girl who's um, six and three quarters, it's important to her, <laughs> six and three, critical stuff, is I get to see how a child communicates is raised with communication. I get to see how a child loves that's love. I get to see the power in a child who's given the space to have her power. And then I get what happened to me. And I understand why the road has been so long and so hard and so difficult. But it is doable. You see, that's the thing that's doable about it. And um, my ability to have a decent relationship today is based entirely upon my willingness, although granted I was about to die, but I went ahead anyway, to go back and to look at my history and to get the truth about what was done to me, the effect it had on me, to experience and express those feelings. Now, there's a lot of sentiment around 12-step recovery that says, come on, come on. That's years ago. Let, would you just live a day at a time? Forget that crap. It was a long time ago. It's got no relevance on what the hell's going on in your life today. Just give it a rest, okay? It's not important. It's not important. The argument is not logical. It is just not logical. I was raised in recovery to, and, and, and told countless times that in the eighth and ninth step, would determine whether or not I was going to stay sober or not. That the men's step is the step that separates the men from the boys. You need to go back and clean up the consequences of what you did. This is one of the most critical steps to recovery. On and on and on. I accept that. It was the most awful step I worked out of all of them. I hated the men's step. Of course, I think our different backgrounds have different, you know, things with that. But I have heard a lot of people who weren't happy to see that I had recovered so they weren't thrilled when I came and said I was sorry. They had more hope that the reason they hadn't seen me for a while was because I was dead. <laughs> so I didn't get the kind of warmth and reception that I was hoping for when I made this amends step. But I made those amends, and it had a tremendous healing power on me, and it had a lot of healing on the people that I talked to. And I didn't do them all right, and I didn't do them all perfect. I called my first wife on the phone, and I said, look, I was about a year and a half sober. I said, look, I'm in this step that's the amends. I've got to go back and talk to the people that I harmed. 
I said, I've been thinking about you and me for months now, and the only conclusion I can come to is if there was ever two people on this planet that deserved each other, it was you and me. And hung up. I thought I'd made them in. I, uh, I, um, it was the truth. We had each other coming, you know. It's just incredible. Of course, I told my sponsor, and I had to redo it differently, but... So if on one side, the consequences of what I did is critical and cleaning up the consequences of my behavior is critical, you cannot then logically tell me that the consequences of what others did to me is not important. The argument will not hold water. It, can't, it will not hold water. If the consequences of my actions are critical, then God damn it, the consequences of the actions of other people on me is critical. So then I begin to get, get it. I start to get the picture. Things happened to me that created a person that's not who I am and made me believe things about myself that weren't true. And then this is the man that I would bring into a relationship. Anything but whole, anything but complete, not in touch with his feelings, unable to express the ones he was in touch with, petrified of your anger, unable to grieve losses, and this is going to be a partner on a lifelong journey with somebody. It's not possible. It doesn't work. So for most of us who came out of systems that weren't nurturing and loving and encouraging and supportive, when we walk up and say hi to a potential partner or lover, we got a, I mean, we have one of these airline baggage carts <laughs> tied to our belt full of baggage that we're going to unload into this relationship. How do you do anything about it? You get help. Get new information. Test your belief system. And we do workshops sometimes, weekend and intensive um, week workshops. And one of the things we have uh, people do is list what they believe about men. Women list what they believe about men. And, and men list what they believe about women. And then we have the men list what they believe about men. And the, and the stuff that comes out is incredible out of grown, educated adults. The stuff that comes out is incredible. But we got filled with shit as children. One of the biggies out of my, my, my generation was sex is dirty, save it for the one you love. <laughs> Want to know why men aren't having sex with the mother of their children on the hood of the car? Because it's dirty. That's for the girl down the street. It's not for this woman that I'm married to that I love was the mother of my child. That stuff's set up when we're little. Little, and it's powerful stuff. It's incredibly powerful stuff. And we get into all this crap. And guys, you know, we got the whole goddamn thing with penis size. At least I came up in a generation where there were no, you know, full corner, full color porno flicks. It was always just sort of, you had to work out what was really big and what wasn't big, you know. And then along, along came uh, Deep Throat, and we were all fucked, you know. There was. There was. <laughs> On the screen, well, how do, you, how do you stack up to this, Bob? <laughs> and then you get to believe that's the most important thing in the world. And it's all that stuff, and that's the stuff that we carry in. So I'm not a bad person, and I wasn't cruel to the women I was with, and I'm not a failure as a human being because I'm married to my seventh wife. I'm a victim of what went on when I was a kid. But they can't do anything about that. I have to fix that. Um, I'll close with this because it's probably the best, um, most insightful piece of information I ever got about the reality of that situation. I was with this girl one time and it was her AA birthday. It was her first AA birthday and her mother was four years sober. Her mother was a biker chick, an armed robber, complete lunatic, crazy person. But four years clean and sober and doing okay. She calls her daughter on her first birthday and says, look, I got no money to buy you nothing for your birthday, okay? So this is it. This is your birthday present. I want you to know that I am responsible for the fact that you can't hold a job. I'm responsible for the fact you can't have a decent relationship. I'm responsible for the fact that you think you're a piece of shit and you dress terrible and you don't take care of yourself. I'm responsible for the fact that you chew up the inside of your mouth. 
I'm responsible for the fact you don't know how to love another human being. I want you to get it that I, your mother, am responsible for those things in your life. She said, but on this your first birthday, please understand you're responsible for the solution. I can't do anything about it. And he told her she loved her and hung up. I thought, whoa, <laughs> you know, there it was, man. There it is. I can deal with that. And I think if it was presented that way, there wouldn't be such a backlash in the, in the, in the community outside recovery against all these people looking back at their childhood to see what went wrong. The message clear. Mom and dad are responsible for how I turned out. I got to fix it. I can live with that. I can do that one. I used to think that there was something terminally wrong with me that was not fixable. I believed at the bottom of my heart there was something awful wrong with me and it wasn't fixable. And I now know that's shame and it's a lie. And it is fixable. But I got to fix it. There's nothing that the original dynamic duo can do to fix it. They're dead anyway. But I mean, if they were alive, when they were alive, there was nothing they could do. So, Tina, will, we'll take a break. Tina, yeah, we'll take a break. Tina will be next, and then we'll also do a whole period for questions and answers, and we'll give you some little exercises and maybe even do at home if you're interested. Okay? So let's do about, yeah, 20 minutes, okay? We don't want that. It's one of those satanic things. Yeah, yeah. Kill your wife. Kill your wife. He sounds like Satan, Beverly. And what does Bob spell backwards? Bob. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm Tina. And I'm are Tina Lamarck. Are you are you okay. hooked up? All right. I intuitively decided she must be ready. Women do that. Uh, it doesn't work with men a lot of times. Um, I, I want to start out by saying that our marriage is probably based on the fact that I do not like lima beans either. <laughs> and will never even put them in a soup. <clears throat> is there anybody here who likes lima beans? No, that's a, it's an interesting thing. And it's a statistical thing. They should ask that when the Census Bureau goes around. <laughs> Do you like lima beans? Um, and also, I was thinking when Bob was talking, we, uh, we started doing uh, relationship workshops in this very impromptu manner. We were going to Virginia to do a, relation, uh, a workshop on something else altogether. And on the plane, Bob said, Honey, the uh, title of the workshop is Relationships. <laughs> so we started fighting. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, not a, I am not one of the covertly angry women. And uh, the, uh, well, on, the, on the plane, or after that workshop, on the way home, we began to talk about what would be a real list about relationships, like why, why you get in them. And I happened to run into this paper we just recently moved. <laughs> so I ran into it. It had two things on it. One was to have somebody to blame. <laughs> do you do that? If you're, if you're with somebody and you've been with somebody for a while, it's probably very fresh in your mind, maybe even this morning or this afternoon or five minutes ago, where um, you're, uh, the heel on your shoe falls off and you think, where's that son of a bitch? <laughs> I, I told him to hang to carry them better when we were moving. I mean, there's a thing that goes on that's, that's kind of destructive towards relationships. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing we had on there, uh, this is all we could come up with, was that you could have somebody to scratch that part of your back that you can't reach. <laughs> so I'm glad we recorded that for posterity, and that I kept it. I knew it was a family treasure. I put it in our, our daughter's baby book. <laughs> along with some of these tape sets. Um, anyway, I was uh, kind of, this is always a subject that is pretty weird. I mean, everybody I know in 12-step recovery is simply uh, desperate to find out <laughs> anything about relationships. And um, I know that the first thing I wanted to know from my sponsor was if I would ever have one. <laughs> 
now looking at the numbers, that was a foolish question, but um, I was afraid I would never have one, and I was really afraid that I would never be able to change enough that I could have one that would be healthy or happy. That was my great concern, because I was excellent at luring unsuspecting victims and hostages in, <laughs> and I had no, no idea what to do with them after a while. Um, and my sponsor said to me, you will get in a relationship. She said, don't come to me in your first year of recovery and tell me that you are in love with somebody because you will be incapable of, of loving anybody until you can love yourself. And that takes a bit of doing and uh, quite a bit of change. And I knew the truth of what she was saying. Um, there are people who think that or say that you ought not to get in any kind of relationship in your first year as if you were living the nun's life. <laughs> if that had been proposed to me, I, I would not have stayed, to tell you the truth. And, um, but I liked my sponsor's approach because it was just honest. And she said, I said, what am I supposed to tell these guys? She said, tell them you have nothing to give and you're using them. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, then they can tell you the truth back. But that's what they're doing, too. And she, she was a worldly woman. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I, can't, I got sober in Los Angeles, and uh, I guess I'm an honorary member of CA because it wasn't existent, although I would have qualified. So I, I really am happy to be here and to feel everybody's enthusiasm, a great deal of enthusiasm. I felt when we were up in Santa Fe, it was beautiful. It was just a beautiful thing, the energy just swirling around this event. Anyway, so I had this very wise sponsor who um, helped me just find the truth and say it. And um, it really changed how I related to people, as you can imagine. Um, and I was a victim of the people that look for newcomers in the program, <laughs> healthy men <laughs> looking for newcomers. And uh, <laughs> they got it, believe me, they got it. But I had this, uh, this phrase that absolved me for what I was about to do. <laughs> when I had um, just under a year sober, one of my drinking buddies called me up and said, I need you to come to work as my receptionist in a beauty shop. This is not what I aspired to do and, uh, in my life. And, uh, sh but she, she called me several times, and I kept saying, I don't want to, and I don't need to, and leave me alone. And, I don't drink anymore, and I don't do those things that we did when we were drinking. Um, and she kept calling back. So finally my sponsor said, I think you should go, go to work, take this job. So I took the job, and she introduced me to a man the first day. And um, that was what I would call a sign from God, that I was in the right place. Some guy was there. So I'm like, anyway. <laughs> cute guy bought me dinner. and. Uh, and he wasn't a drunk, and um, I told him I was on the program because that's what I was told to do. Tell him you're on the program. Tell him you're sick. <laughs> now, you may think that's a put down. For me, it was a relief because I didn't have to keep doing this song and dance that I was very good at, but it was leaving me more and more lonely. It was a great heartbreak to me that I was fully aware of the fact that I felt nothing for these men that I had captured and enslaved. And um, I, I mean, I would say all the words and do all the stuff, but there was nothing going back and forth here, nothing. And I thought, this is sad. What am I going to do? Well, I don't feel love. I don't have it. It didn't go in on the conveyor belt. And when my sponsor said those fateful words to me about, you don't love yourself yet, so you can't really pass it on, it was um, as if the door of this trap that I myself was also in uh, was opened because I thought there's a solution and this is going to get better. Um, and a lot of what kept me coming around was this hope to eventually be able to connect with a human being and love them. Um, <clears throat> and I was told to start with the women in the program. You know, get with the women. She'd say, go to the women's meetings and just 
tell them who you are, no matter what faces they make. And they did. Uh, <laughs> but they laughed a lot, too, which was good. And um, she said, when a guy asks you out, tell him you put your program first and, uh, and do that. And this is stuff I had no idea. And what that translated into my mind was that I had never learned to place any value on myself at all. And the concept of putting my program first or trying to grow and change was completely foreign to me. I had never thought of such a revolutionary idea. And I thought, these women are teaching me the stuff you do and the stuff you say that eventually you change how you feel about yourself. And I knew that that had to change in a big way for me to survive and for me to even stay alive. I uh, <clears throat> eventually ended up married to this man and um, he was not on the program <clears throat> and I experienced something kind of sad there we had a lot of fun and a uh, great relationship and then I, and I used to say this thing I don't know if you've ever heard this or said this thing I'd say you know I don't do that stuff I used to do when I was drinking and using and I believed that that I didn't do stuff that was really destructive and cruel because I wasn't putting any more rocket fuel into me and the day came when I did revert back to what I did, which is I found somebody else and uh, left this guy just uh, waving in the breeze. And we had been together for seven years. And what really was at the bottom of this, besides a life uh, history of destructive relationships and dead-end relationships, was that I was going to the program, I was going to Al-Anon, because my, my wise sponsor also said to me, honey, you're not going to learn how to have a relationship in AA. You're going to have to go to Al-Anon, because the people in AA <coughs> are just like you. And NA, they don't know how to have a relationship either. And you're, you're only going to hear a little snippet here and a snippet there from a few people. Go where people are talking about how to take these 12 steps and this program and work it in your home and work it in your relationships with other human beings. This was good for me that she said this, and I began to do it. And somewhere along the line, what happened is I learned to communicate with all the folks I know on the program. Like, nya, 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 nya. you know, you get, you get, get out of here and go to a coffee shop and go, you got to hear what is going on in there. But I couldn't do it with the person I was in a relationship with. And that was a sad thing, because eventually our paths went in two different directions. And I had accumulated a lot of anger and resentment, and I never learned to go and say, I hate you. I was afraid of them, and um, <clears throat> that left us in two separate, uh, on two separate planets, and that relationship broke up. And uh, at the end of the thing, this husband said to me, why didn't you force me to go to Al-Anon? Because he was blaming me, and he was right, but <clears throat> that wasn't the thing to blame me for. <laughs> and he said, why didn't you force me? And I remember just saying, you can't. The bit is, I've been going up to al -Anon for years, and I can't force you to go. Um, so it was one of those things that had the time bomb built in at the beginning, <clears throat> at the factory, just like most of the relationships I had. <clears throat> I um, went on to another kind of pretty long relationship for about four years, um, and things went a lot better. I learned to talk. I learned to really say what was on my mind to the person, even though it scared the shit out of me to go and tell them what was going on. And we talked, and we talked, and we talked, and we were very good friends. <clears throat> and I saw the value of being friends with the person that you sleep with. Ha! Ah, what a weird idea. <laughs> I didn't even care if I liked them before. <clears throat> they kind of got in the way. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> oh, God, all those introductions and stuff. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we were very good friends, uh, but he had a little problem, too. He was leading a double life himself. In other words, I had the same thing done to me that I had done. Isn't that odd? Have you had that happen? <clears throat> and so what came about is I, I was uh, going to speak at an AA conference a young people's conference. <clears throat> my sponsor had been asked, and she was booked, and she said, well, I've got this person. You should ask her before she's too old to speak at a young person's conference. <laughs> and so I said, well, who else is speaking? I said, yes, because it, uh, yeah, I pick up the phone. I'm in some city distant from where I got sober. And I pick up the phone, 
And the guy who's asking me to come speak at this conference is the same guy who answered the phone 12 years before when I called central office in a city over 100 miles away from that. So I know I've got to say yes to him. Yes, I'll be there. <clears throat> and um, one of the other speakers was Bob Earl. Um, and I thought that was annoying because I did. <laughs> it would be really too crowded and stuff because I didn't, uh, I didn't care for him. We had uh, our paths had intersected several times before, and I didn't, I didn't like him, and he, he just couldn't give a shit about me either. And uh, so I go off to this conference to speak, and I'm living with somebody else, and we're going to get married, and everything's hunky dory, and. I go to the conference and there's this big kaboom, this big kaboom. Oh dear, this is a problem. I say, well, I'm not going to do that again. I say, I'm with somebody else. I'm committed. We're going to get married. We can be friends. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Within a week, I went home and the man that I trusted so much stayed out all night one night. I don't know if you translate that the way I translated it. <laughs> But I figured he probably wasn't driving around in his car all night long <laughs> <clears throat> and that I had been served notice. And this was a great blow to me because I like to think of myself as this tremendous uh, femme fatale and, well, he was not interested, let me tell you, and uh, suddenly. And uh, what I came to understand was that <clears throat> although this fellow wasn't on the program, he hadn't been drinking or using when I was with him, but his disease probably had reactivated. Um, and it was time for me to go. God just got me out of there. <clears throat> and uh, I began this journey driving around through the Southwest, uh, avoiding Bob and uh, <laughs> simultaneously trying to meet with him and uh, being scared to death, really scared to death. And what was frightening for me was that I had this un unholy feeling that I had met my match. And um, this was somebody who was known to be a deadly element in our community and I knew I was and I thought this is really spooky and I don't I don't even want to see you know I, I don't even think I like the guy but uh, <clears throat> I loved him at the same time somehow it it, came, it crept up on me and him and we really fought that I can remember having these conversations w which went something like I don't want to say I love you he said because I've said it so many times before and it means nothing so I said okay same to you <laughs> this went on until God throws the bulldozer back and forth over us a whole bunch of times and we were screaming, okay, okay, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> I have spent my entire life <clears throat> going to any length to avoid having children. I have been what you would call an avowed child hater, identifying with W.C. Fields. I love children. I don't know. It's something about eating them. It's not me. And uh, dead, dead or dormant maternal feelings. And um, so we began to have this chemistry between us about wanting to have a child as time went on. And uh, I was very shocked by this because it had nothing to do with the person I knew myself to be. I mean, really, I would go to any length to not have a kid. And uh, this thing that started to take place was uh, in the nature of a surrender. And I don't think that it's for everybody. But because it was such a surprise to me, it really got my attention. And I remember as God was laughingly pulling the bulldozer back and forth over our prone bodies, and Bob calling me up at, at a, uh, there was a phone booth out in Joshua Tree, California. Any of you know that charming? high place yeah and uh, there's a phone booth out in the middle of the desert and with a light bulb and bugs and a <laughs> fluorescent light and I was out there and he's going when was the last time you thought about having a baby and that and I said well you know what 15 minutes and we had gone on for months without ever discussing this subject and um, and I said what about you since I figured what the fuck is he asking me this for mm -hmm. And he said, oh, five, ten minutes. And uh, so we began this communication about what was happening to us. And uh, I think you can only take the third step for so long, and then it starts to take you. And um, I was thinking over the last week, if there's 
only one thing that I say here today, it is this, that it is my experience that if we work the program and we uh, stay clean and sober, that eventually God gets us with the person we're supposed to be with. Well, for some of us, it's a series of people. That's just kind of a realistic thing. Um, and the people that I've known, it's taken a good long time. I mean, I think, how long were you sober when we got together? Long time. About um, 23 years. 23 years. And um, that's not said to discourage you, but to give you a more realistic uh, thing than what you might be measuring yourself against. <laughs> and it took me, I was uh, 12 years or something. And, and I don't discount the relationships that I was in before because they were really fabulous and I grew tremendously in them. I grew as far as I could because I had the tools of this program to do so. Was, but when Bob was talking earlier about this thing with, um, that we do about talking, I, I think that this is a wonderful thing that we happened upon and we say we need to go for a walk and talk and it means I'm just about ready to stab you, honey, <laughs> while you're sleeping with an ice pick. <laughs> and so we will go out and, and we, the person who calls the walk and talk starts talking and just spills out everything uncensored, sounds terrible, sound like a selfish, spoiled brat, which I've come to understand that I am. And um, I don't feel so embarrassed about it anymore because everybody in the room is. Um, <coughs> and uh, so I can just let off all of this steam and let this person know what's really on my mind. And, and this thing about I feel that when you do this, I feel that this is a big problem for me because it's totally dishonest. Um, but I'm a very volatile person, as you can just guess. And um, so I can't say it nice like that. I don't say it really mean. I mean, part of our commitment is we don't, have, we don't say fuck you to each other. Oh, we want to. Yes. So bad. Fuck <laughs> you. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, God. But you know, he's really mean and he says it right back. And then I'll keep going. <laughs> What happens is there's no further communication once that happens. And we don't call each other all the good names that we know, dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and when you know us, you know how, what an effort that, that takes. And uh, we don't say that stuff. So that we can keep talking and I can keep listening. I remember sitting at our little table at our house in Santa Fe years ago and Bob saying, I need to talk to you about something and my insides just going, no, you know, no, I, I almost couldn't stand to hear it. And I had to say to myself, this part of me that's grown in the program had to say, just sit down and hold still. If it's really bad, you can leave him forever if you have to. But you know, having to talk myself down so I could even listen and then quiet that down so that I could hear what he was saying. And the truth was it wasn't bad, really, what he had to say. And then it gave me a chance to open up about what I needed to say, too, later on. And it was a shock to Bob when he found out that we do talk back. And I remember saying that. What do you think I'm supposed to do? Just sit here and listen to you? Your marvelousness? <laughs> and there were lots of cracks about how he was Mr. Know-it-all and the AA speaker and all this, and that, that that didn't cut any shit in our house as far as I was concerned. And, um, <laughs> But you know what? He was able to hear that and also to laugh and then to listen. And we laugh a lot. We really, I'm telling you, our senses of humor are just as sick as they ever were in case you're worried about losing that. And together, <laughs> together the things that we can say are so foul and so warped and we end up screaming with happiness at having found such another partner. So brilliant and witty. <laughs> But well, this wasn't so very witty, but of course, you know, on the way out here, we had to have a fight. And um, so that we could speak without having one right here. <laughs> so I'm driving along, and I see this great configuration of the mesas, and the, you know, there's a cut through, and these little 
uh, cinder cones back there, and I say, God, I'd love to paint that. And I'm looking, and he's going, look at the light! <laughs> Which really made me angry. <laughs> he said, it's just like when you tell me to look at the road, and I'm lying. <laughs> and I didn't think it was funny then. And then um, <laughs> somehow or other, we got each other laughing, you know. We got each other laughing, and it was a fine thing. Uh, and I remembered that I should watch the road, it was true. And uh, <laughs> I only draw when I'm driving when I'm in the car alone. And, uh, <laughs> so if you ever read about it, you'll know what happened. Um, paper was all over the car. <laughs> anyway, um, it's been an incredible adventure. We had to go through things like taking care of my mother. <clears throat> we were living in Santa Fe when we got together and got married and had our little girl. and. Um, and I mysteriously switched over from a child hater to somebody who becomes goopy at the sight of child or children and want to tear their little toes and stuff and kiss them. And <laughs> what happened to me? I'm a bitch. Anyway, um, we were <laughs> we were living in this house and. Um, Bob was going to speak in Tucson for the weekend, and we went to Tucson with the kid in the car, and all the baby goop, and the, you know what you carry if you have a one-year-old, it's got the stroller and the everything, and there's stuff hanging out the windows, and pampers in the, in the uh, you know, garbage thing. And, uh, <laughs> and um, so my mother called me up, and she said, you know, your dad's acting really weird. Can you, can you get in the car and come? And I threw the kid in the car, but he was acting very weird. And we said, put him in the hospital, I'll be there tomorrow. And so I drove to California and Bob came after he was done. And in the course of a few days, my dad turned from this very um, eccentric and interesting, great friend to me um, into a vegetable. And he died within two weeks. And um, <clears throat> at that time, we had this sinking feeling that we were not going to be able to come home again, which is what happened. We, we left our house and I never saw it again. We sold it long distance. And um, <clears throat> my parents were full of flaws, uh, but I really loved them a lot. And they really loved me a lot. And we were much closer than parents usually are. And uh, so I didn't feel okay about leaving my mother to just uh, die of a broken heart there. Uh, when my dad was dead, <clears throat> so we stayed until we could sell her place and we moved to Arizona. And um, <clears throat> during the time that we were at that place in California, it was very small, I was very unhappy because I missed my, ba my dad so badly. And, uh, um, and I'd seen it coming, uh, but uh, they didn't, so nobody was really ready. Intuitively, I had felt that this was coming at the time I had the baby and that somehow nature, in nature's wisdom, had conspired to link me up to something that would really keep me rooted to this world. And um, <clears throat> so, it, within the first few days that we were there, uh, I want to tell you that when my, my parents and Bob met, they, they instantly hated each other. <laughs> now, you think he's a big hero, but let me tell you, my parents just, it was like, cats and dogs that had met, never met, and uh, I knew this, and it was not a good thing, because I was going to stick around with him, and I knew that, and, um, and I wasn't going to give up my parents for a relationship, because I've learned not to give up myself for a relationship anymore. And um, I remember sitting down with Bob and saying, look, you know, I know you think they're terribly fucked up and they've ruined my life as alcoholics, but I've been in therapy for years. and." Uh, and uh, there's something else there that's much bigger, and I love them a lot, and I'm going to want to see them. So anyway, this was like very difficult to make this all work, where I had to say to Bob, if you're going to be uncomfortable every time we go see them, and you're going to be sending out va bad vibes the whole time, then, then you stay home and I'll go see them. And I remember the phone call with my dad, or actually he had left the house, but I called him up and he was very frosty with me on the phone before he died when I first come to New Mexico. I mean, fro does anyone have a frosty parent in here, or a frosty somebody? <laughs> Raise your hand. I mean, it's like, it's, it's sadism cranked up to the maximum. <laughs> it's like, you don't, I don't even care about you. And when it comes from your parent, you know you've been given the big chill. 
And I got this on the phone. I got off the phone and I thought, pick the phone up again, and I dialed right back. And my dad had left the house and I, it couldn't wait. And I said to my mother, if this continues, you will not hear from me any longer. This is what I need to do. I'm with this guy. I'm going to stay with this guy. I'm in New Mexico. And if you don't like it and you can't come to terms with it, then we're done. And th that was not a light, uh, something I took lightly. It was like from the heart. It's like I have to say this just like I had to say it to Bob about my parents. Within the first few days that we were all living together, oh, geez, my mother and Bob got into a little tiff. And my mother is in full-on grieving for somebody she's been married for for over 50 years. And you know my language, it's clear what it is right now. Speaking here today, I never say that stuff in front of my mom and dad, never did. That was my choice, and um, it really upset them. And um, I'm sitting there listening to this conversation about finances go back and forth, and all of a sudden, before I can put a tennis racket in my husband's mouth, he turns around and says to my mother, Fuck you! <laughs> it's like saying it to Mother Teresa, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> my mother was no saint, but it was a taboo in between me and my parents that I didn't care to break. They didn't say that stuff to me, and I didn't say it to them. Bob did. And, uh, <laughs> by then, fortunately, I'd been in Al Anon many years. And I knew that I was not supposed to get in there and say, He didn't say that. <laughs> you didn't mean that, did you, honey? Tell mommy you didn't mean that. And, uh, <clears throat> it's complex being in a relationship with somebody who had such a negative experience with their own mother, too. It's, uh, there are some landmines in there, and he's been busy ta digging them out, but they're still here and there. Don't step on that one. And, um, <laughs> oh, he just told Mom to fuck off. <laughs> Could have been symbolic, I hope. And um, So I went outside and I paced for about 20, 30 minutes, and it was killing me because I thought she's in the worst grief she's ever faced in her life. And... Um, after a while, when I sorted out all my shredded feelings, I went in and said, can you, can you do something to bridge this gap here, Bob? Because he had a program and she didn't. And he did. I don't know how he did it. And she started crying about how she was really feeling bad. She just lost her husband, which what she needed to do, too. He did what he needed to do. She did what she needed to do so they could figure out how we were all going to live in this too small house together. And... Um, <clears throat> Therein began a great friendship, <coughs> oddly enough. I mean, um, it was Bob who was there when my dad was dying, this man that had hated him, and it was a year and a half later, and he knew that he could trust him. And I'm convinced my dad knew I was linked up with somebody that was strong enough for me to be with. So he didn't have to be quite so nervous that I was going to be trading him in right away. He didn't like it, though. He didn't like that giving up his uh, hold on me, I think. And this is stuff on a very deep kind of psychic level. I don't mean to sound new agey, but it's a real thing. On a soul level, my relationship to my parents changed when I hooked up with Bob. They, we all knew it. And, um, and when it came time for my mother to die, it was Bob and me in bed with her at home. And I could let my mother come home and die. We took care of her for two and a half years of hell and wonderful stuff. Um, um, it was one of the greatest and uh, most difficult things I will do in my lifetime was to take care of my mom. Okay, They had all stopped drinking, my parents, uh, years before, or this never would have taken place. I wouldn't have taken our, our daughter in. I wouldn't have taken me in again. Um, and we looked after her for this time, and what I couldn't do, Bob could do. I remember conversations with him where he'd say, look, you know, your anger's getting out of hand. <laughs> And um, I went away and I thought about that <coughs> this while we were living with her because there's a great deal of tension that comes up when you're back with your folks, mm -hmm. and uh, especially when they're sick. I mean, it was very stressful. And, um, and I went away and I thought about that. And not being one to uh, just take it at his word, I thought, what do I think about that? And I came back and I thought, I don't feel like that. That's me. It's coming out. It isn't going in. And he was concerned about the effects this would have on our little girl. 
Now, I wasn't calling her names or anything. I was just growling. I was like a, a Tasmanian devil in the kitchen, you know, yelling at the dog, get out, get out, get out. And, and I thought, what do you expect? This is a hard thing. This is a very hard thing. And um, I remember saying, I don't think that this is going to hurt our child because it's honest and it's coming out. And I, it's not aimed at her. It's pretty free-floating, and I know it's frightening, but I can't do this otherwise. And uh, Bob was able to be very nice and kind with my mom. I had those moments too, but the tension was incredible. Um, we were living in a small community where we had no help, and um, no help of any kind. The 12-step meetings were uh, uh, empty, and they'll come up to me afterwards and say there's no such thing, because there is. And uh, I found ourselves in a desperate time in our lives in 12-step meetings where there was little humanity. There was a lot of stuff about the program or drinking, <clears throat> but there was little humanity, less humor, and uh, nobody was nodding their head in the room when I was crying. And nobody else was crying. And so we made plans to get out of that place, and we went to a city where there were 12-step meetings that were great, and there was caregivers group through Pima County uh, Caregivers, or um, Council on Aging, and they had a free group for people who were doing this. and. Um, it was a real experience to go to this group, and there'd be people in their 60s and 70s and uh, thereabouts taking care of older parents, and uh, n there wasn't anybody my age who was there. I guess they figured they were still running, so they weren't coming in to take this job on. And uh, I remember the faces of the people in this caregiver's group when I said, should say now, how the facilitator now, how do you feel today? And I'd say, well, I want to take a chainsaw and kill my mother. <laughs> and the that's ordinary conversation here. <laughs> <laughs> Not so there. But, <laughs> but I, know that I knew that the people identified. I mean, they made it clear, but they came from a different generation, and they weren't in a 12-step meeting, so they didn't go, oh, yeah, I'm in jail. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> can I use it after you? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Anyway, when it came time for my mom to die, we were there, and we were able to say to the doctor, bring her home, let her come home and let her die in her bed. And um, it's been an extraordinary thing, because Bob and I, from the time we got together, it was as if the uh, firecrackers started going off, and our lives have never slowed down. Uh, we got together, just that was enough. Uh, we uh, had this child, went through pregnancy, and got married, and... And there I was, the seventh Mrs. Earl. And uh, I didn't tell my mom that. She read it in his book. She called me in one day. She said, Jesus Christ, Dana, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> why? What could they have said? I heard a lot of interesting comments about that. But you know what I said to my friends, my girlfriends, who had the nerve to say it to my face, because you know most of them don't. They like to say it behind your back. And, uh, and I said, you know what? We have about as good a chance as anybody. That's what I know. And we got a program. I've been in therapy for, I mean, you know, I wouldn't even guess how long then, uh, maybe 15 years or something. And it wasn't just because I was all ruined. It was because I was on the inner adventure at that point. And Bob had been in therapy for close to nine years. Um, he'd been working, and I'd been working. And we knew what we'd done wrong. And we were able to talk. We could really, really, really talk. And um, even though it was hard for us, and I had to learn when we'd start fighting not to leave the room. I, I just have to leave the room. I couldn't handle it. And I, I said to myself, you know, dear, you must go back in the room and finish this conversation. And I learned to come and stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody who is pretty formidable to argue with <laughs> and, uh, and continue the conversation and uh, continue the dialogue which has been incredible because what I found is that God finally put me with somebody who could continue the dialogue and who was uh, not constantly trying to mold me into something else. Not that anybody bothered to try that, but, you know, <laughs> um, th it was, uh, we have a, mm, a relationship that's grown a lot through all these adventures and difficult things like taking care of all our parents dying. When my dad died, his mom died within two weeks, either bef a week before or after. And he had just had to put her in, you know, do the thing with the parent where you look for the board and care home to put him in. 
long distance, um, and uh, his stepdaughter from the last the last marriage wa had been found dumped out of a car, dead of a drug overdose. This happened within a, about a six week period, and I just thank God we got put together, really. And I know I said to Bob uh, when my mother died, I said to him, you know. I feel, although my mother was not a member of a 12-step program, she did quit drinking. And uh, the doctors kindly put her right on other medication. However, mm -hmm. the point of the matter was she wasn't slurring, falling yeah. down drunk. They did what they did so that she wouldn't commit suicide. And um, I said to him, you know, I feel like what happened is that we went on the greatest 12-step call of our lives. Mm -hmm. And it was good to have somebody who was on the same path and on the same wavelength understanding that this was a gift and a lesson from God and not some horrible torture because I, I didn't break off communication with my parents at some point. And when my mother died, I remember walking out in the desert in back of our house in Tucson, and it was beautiful, just deserty out there. And I remember feeling like I was floating, really floating, like my feet were not on the ground. And I thought, what is this? What is this feeling? And I after I walked a little bit longer, I, I guessed that it must be that it was the weight of this world coming off of me, and I was light. And this thing came through to me that just shocked me, because I didn't see this as I was going along. This voice came to me and said, you were a great daughter. And I didn't, I knew what, how I had lived. But I can never string it together that this is what I was doing, that it was so important to me to have this relationship with this woman who was a mess, you know, a drunk every day while I, from the time I can remember, drinking every day in her closet. Last four years of her life, she kind of cleans up and sobers up. And, uh, but I was always there for them, getting them out of jail and stuff when they were in trouble, my mom and dad, until I went to Al-Anon and learned not to, and they learned not to go to jail right then. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call her on Saturday night. She's not so nice when she shows up at the hospital anymore. And, uh, but there was this thing of wanting to have a relationship that reached resolution, um, where the accounts were clear and clean. And uh, when my mother died, before she died, I said to myself, now, is there anything you haven't said to your mother? And believe me, I said everything. There was no, I mean, my parents knew who I was. I was atrocious in front of them. But the point was, I knew they loved me because they saw the full thing, this beautiful, radiant daughter who was an artist, and they honored me in every way imaginable because of that. And, and this really nasty, destructive little brat that they had, all in the same package. <laughs> And they loved me, and I knew this. Um, I can't remember where I was going with that one, but um, the thing was that somehow we came to the end of the deal, and I knew that it was right between us. Oh, I know what it was. It's funny when you're not smoking grass how it comes back. I said to myself, <laughs> what are you, what are you? <laughs> that day, and uh, I said, there's one thing I never told my mother, which was that somewhere along the line I started writing a book, and I didn't know I was going to write a book, and I wrote one, and I finished it, and I didn't know that when I started out. I just started writing, and it took me five years, and uh, a rocky five years where it was stuffed in my purse in little pieces and little <laughs> suitcases, but I knew where they were, and... Um, and I was writing this book about what my life was like as an artist, and my parents had really supported me as an artist tremendously. And um, far beyond, I don't know how they did it, really. And uh, when my mother was back from the hospital and we knew she was going to die, she told me she couldn't read anymore. And, uh, and uh, I said, you know, with a great deal of trepidation, because I knew she couldn't read, and I had poured a lot of stuff out about my family in this thing, and I thought, i got to pretend they're never going to see this thing, or I'm not going to write the truth. Just like when you're in a meeting or you're writing an inventory, you got to somehow pretend nobody's going to see this thing for it to come out complete and in its uncensored form. And I said to my mother, I, I wrote a book. And her face, her face became so illuminated. And she looked at me, you know, in this way that, that a parent or a dear friend or a wise older friend, person might look through you. And she assessed me in this very calm way. And she said to me, I always knew you were great. 
And, the, and this was a beautiful thing because, you know, I, I had lived a double life a lot of my life. And I didn't want my parents to know a lot of things I was doing and thinking and certainly not who I was doing them with. And, um, and just telling her that was just the last thing because I thought, what would be, maybe I would sit later and say, I wish I'd told her that. And when I told her it was about being an artist, and I said, you know, I gave her the credit for helping me do it, you know, for all the art lessons, for hanging my paintings, for everything. And um, she wanted that. And I told her she was a good mother. And I think that it was the program that enabled me to come so far. And I knew when that relationship was complete that I had passed through college in relationships, and I could have them all the way through from the beginning the very last page where it says the end. And I, I could feel great about it, really great about it. And this, I would tell you, carries over in your primary relationship. Um, these things that I learned with my parents, if I hadn't learned them, we wouldn't be together. Um, and, um, and I really felt like I couldn't have done that thing for my mother where we, we were after birth. We were birthing. We were birthing my mother when she was dying. I saw that she was laboring to die. And we were birthing her to something else, something which our, our culture is remarkably phobic about and ignorant that we will all do. And we sat right there with her and did it with her and told her it was OK. It was okay to go. We did everything. We, I touched her hair and kissed her face because I knew it was the last. And just being able to do that, to know that I should do that, that I wanted to do it, and that I should record what it felt like to touch her face and her hair, all this stuff. This is strictly due to the program that my mother and father didn't have to watch me die of my disease. Because although I was the youngest addict, alcoholic, in a 100% addicted family, I was the one that was going down in flames the fastest. And I was, for a long time, the only one in recovery. And I have watched every member of my family die, except my brother, who surfaced after 10 years of no word, a couple of weeks after my dad died, and told us he had gotten sober, out of nowhere, in his 50s. So it's a, it's a big package, the relationship package. <laughs> oh, God. And it's tied up with sparklers and firecrackers when you pull the ribbon. And, I, and I, I really wish that all of you would find what I half and more of what I found here. Because I turned from a person who couldn't love herself to a person who's had tremendous love and completion in my life. Uh, which is passed on to our daughter, who sees a great deal of emotion flowing like a river through our house. And our house is full of people all the time. There are people in our bed, in our kitchen, everywhere. They're crying. They're having babies. They're getting married. They're getting divorced. I'm loaning our wedding ring so they can get married. Get on the next jet, honey. Hurry. <laughs> that was two weeks ago. <laughs> and it is a beautiful thing to feel part of this part of life, this huge river that's gushing, people that we all should be dead, and we're all coming back to life. So uh, I'm quite grateful. And um, I guess we have time for some questions. We go till 4.30, so blow your nose and... <laughs> <laughs> what's the capital of North Dakota? <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> that question was, what's the capital of North Dakota? <laughs> I, think, I think one of the points that she made is really important because um, I had a sponsor one time who said his biggest problem with God was that his own personal watch ran in seconds and that God's watch ran in days. And... Uh, <laughs> Nothing ever arrived at the time that he thought it was supposed to arrive. And so I can remember sitting um, 17 years, no, about 16 years sober in a condo um, in Santa Barbara 
watching the Osmond family uh, Christmas show with a friend of mine. My then wife was a flight attendant and she was in um, New York on a trip. And I was in tears watching this Osmond family Christmas show. <laughs> and I said to this guy, I said, you know what, man? I'm never going to be able to have this. This is never going to be mine. It's not going to be mine. I can't do it. I've tried and i tried. And I knew that that marriage at that time, which was number five, was on the rocks and going down the tubes. And it broke my heart that I was never, ever going to be able to have that. So here I am, and I have it all, but I'm doing it much later than I had planned on doing it. <laughs> that must be Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Catch you later, Morgan. <laughs> Hi, Cooper. <laughs> and so I think about things like I'm going to be 70 when Alexander graduates high school, but I'm as it, it, it's going, I'm 59 now, I'll probably be a pretty powerful 70, so I don't have a hell of a lot to worry about. And, I mean, I know a lot of people do this at 30, and, and I'm doing it a little later. And, and we've also had to make other decisions, and I think these are important to talk about. From the gate, all we ever talked about was two children. All we wanted was two children. I mean, we both wanted two children. We prayed for a paternal twin. A boy and a girl. We thought this would just be ideal, you know, it would just be perfect. Get them both at once, get out of the way. <laughs> and when Alexander was about two and a half or rolling up on a three, it was time to make the decision about the second child. And it was probably the longest day and one of the worst days of our lives. Because at the end of the day, after we talked and cried and yelled and screamed and talked and cried and yelled and screamed, we came to the only conclusion we could come to, which is we don't have enough for two children. Um, it's not there. We don't have the physical strength. I, I mean, uh, there are limitations. I am not 30 anymore. I am 58. And I do get tired, and, my, and, and I don't have the physical strength I'd like to have, although I have a hell of a lot of it for my age. And we don't have the emotional package for two. We burn down on one. We have to constantly hand her when she's little back and forth to whoever was in a good place. We have to, we have to quick give the kid over to the one that was feeling cool so she wouldn't have to, you know, get all this shit out of the other parent. And when both of us were in a bad place, we'd hire somebody to come in who was in a good spirit and we'd give the kid to her. But after we weighed that all out and we had to come to the final decision, that in all honesty, if we were going to give Alexander her best shot, and we were going to give our, our marriage a shot, we could not bring in no more child. It was not possible for us. And i got to tell you, that was a tough day, but I believe today that that's really about the honesty and the relationship between people. And I think everybody in our little unit is going to benefit from our ability to weigh carefully. And I'm not saying anybody else don't have any two children or three children or four children. I'm just saying we had to weigh what was realistic for us. And the second child was not realistic for us. And it made us both very sad and it broke our hearts. And it now we're really us. glad we did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're still tired. <laughs> we're still tired and, and we're glad we did it. And I had, a friend, I had a friend of mine come up to me not long ago in a situation. He said, and he has a little girl who's three and his wife is pregnant with her second child. And he's uh, maybe 10 years younger than me. Not, maybe not that. And... Um, he said, you know, I've heard you guys talk about that. And he said, I'm very uh, scared. He said, because our second one is on the way. And I could say to this guy, on all honesty, I said, i got to be a little crass at the moment, John. Because this guy is, is, is worth um, tens of millions of dollars. And I said to him, I must tell you that if I had your money, we'd have a second child. In, in a heartbeat. Because we could afford it to hire the necessary people to do the physical work that needed to be done to free us up so we're not killing ourselves so that we have the emotional support to give the kid. I could hire a cook to cook. Tina doesn't have to cook anymore if I had his money. We could hire living nannies and have them there 24 hours a day. To take, a take care of us. To take care of us. But we could have done it. And, and, and so, and I, and I, cause I want my friend to know that I think he's doing the right thing. And if I had his money, we, we would have done it too. But it's just part of this process. How many times have people had children that neither one of them wanted to have? You know, they couldn't talk to each other. And mm. they keep coming back to, it's about talking. It's about talking. I used to hear that, like, ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
And it's hard, but it's, it's, it's the only thing we got. And, and two, and I do think part of it is you need to find a match. You know, I mean, really a match. Somebody that's a match. Somebody who's just as shitty as you are, <laughs> just as evil as you are, just as, uh, as capable of standing in there and hanging in there as an argument as you are. I really think, well, at least that's what I need is a match. I, I've tried having, you know, subservient, quiet, obedient, and I bore really easily. And, 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 and when I'm bored, I'm dangerous to a relationship. If I'm bored, I'm dangerous to a relationship. Mm. Very dangerous. And one thing I can say, honest to God, Tina's never done is bore me. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the ground rules surrounding your walk and talks and kind of describe the scenario of how one goes? Okay. Um, um, gee, let me think of a good one. I was trying to think of that because we had some really good petty ones about... Um, well, usually we have a whole conglomeration of shit stamps that we've been sticking in the little book, the little brown book. What, what, happens, <laughs> what, what happens is this, is the first thing we notice, the first warning sign is that we begin to become less affectionate with each other. <laughs> there's, there's less physical affection in touching and kissing and stroking and talking. And, and that's the first indicator that we're starting to store stuff up. That, and, and, the, and we're, you know, we're building up this little pot. And whoever seems to hit the surface of it first will say, I need to walk and talk. And oftentimes why we put it off so long is that sometimes it's very petty stuff. Like she got furious once, my computer cost more than hers. And, <laughs> and she did not want to say that, but it was driving her fucking crazy. <laughs> that I had spent more money on my computer. Now, but, you kept getting the new one, yeah, and I got the old that's one. Right. Well, that's right. Till the last time. Was, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We what? bought two new ones. We now have two identical computers. But <laughs> now think of the money you would have had to spend in therapy. It was just as well to buy the computer. But it can be something at the bottom that's that simple. You know, like I'm always giving her the old computer and I get the new one. And, and that will be the one that comes uh. off the top. And the reason we don't want to discuss it is it is kind of petty and stuff. Yeah, you're giving me the old computer and you get the new one. And she hates the look. <laughs> She hates to look like that, and I hate to look like that to her, because I remember when we were building the house we're in now, I had to point out to her the square footage of her office was bigger than mine. It fucking killed me to tell her that. <laughs> <laughs> Kill me. I do not want to admit to that kind of pettiness. <laughs> but then he had to tell me a lot. But, <laughs> frequently. So it changed. But, <laughs> it didn't change. But, but the point is, if I keep that stuff quiet, for me, as far as a relationship is concerned, it's like dripping acid. It just will drop, drop, drop. We have no rules for the walk and talk. None. Other than we do not say fuck you. That's an absolute rule in our house. Because we both, for both of us, that's a conversation stopper. That's the absolute end of the conversation. There's nowhere to go from there for me, and there's nowhere to go from there for her. So we will really blurt stuff out. I will say, God damn it, you know, you're doing so... Um, uh, most of ours come over parenting. I'll say, I think you, um, I'll find something that she's doing as a parent that I think sucks. And I'll do a walk and talk because I know it's going to make her mad, right? And she, and I'll just say that I think what you're doing sucks. I won't say, when you talk to our daughter in that kind of voice, it makes me feel, you know, I'll say shit like, you are impressing me as a rotten fucking mother at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and then, boy, she comes right back. You know, I, I mean, I got to know that somewhere down this walk, because we're going out one way and we're coming back the other way, uh, she's going to have her time. I mean, it's agreed to. And then she'll come back and defend herself or explain to me why she's doing what she's doing. And then at the end, if there's been any... Either one of us feels that we've been abusive in what we have said, we will apologize for it. We'll say, look, you didn't deserve to be called a rotten mother. You're really a wonderful mom, and it was just upsetting me, and that's how I came out. So there are no rules. We found for both of us that ground rules can be very stifling. Well, we do, though. Whoever starts talking, we let them say everything. Yeah. I mean, the thing is to be quiet, not respond. Yeah. So the, 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 everything. So in that way, we have that kind of form to it. And then, then I'll say, are you done? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Bob's explaining this very carefully, but we actually don't, we don't say abusive stuff to each other when we're saying it. You are usually pretty good. You know, yeah. About, yeah. Yeah. You know, something you said, Bob, really got me thinking about not just grieving the past relationship, 
But grieving this one, mm. if that makes any sense. Grieving the fact that Dan's just a guy. He's not dead. He's not going to take care of me. You know that it's whole... not the prince. Yeah, just feeling the grief of giving up the fantasy yeah. in order to love the reality. It's That's a process a good point. I find myself going through again and again. And grieving that I'm not the princess who came into being because the prince came along. That I'm not that, you know? That, yep. that I've got all these defects of character too. And I hate them when they come out. I hate them. And, and knowing they will, and they do, and that's life. Mm -hmm. The humanness. Yeah. One of the things we try and do is honor each other's human. Her human is not always acceptable to me. And my human is not always acceptable to her. But I, if I'm going to be a partner, I must support her in being who she is. And she must support me in being who I am. Because that's what a partnership is all about. And i got to tell you, it is an incredible, um, as a man, to be with a partner who supports me in who I am. Is, 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 it was difficult for me to get used to. And when I have wild ideas, like maybe I'm going to give up something that represents tons of income to us, and, um, and when we were first together and Alexander had been born and I, and I, I watched a, a movie that really um, shook me up about uh, the responsibility of a writer it was called Amazing Grace and Chuck or something. And I thought, my God, people cared enough to make this movie, you know. And, and I thought about all the television I'd written for the preceding 20 years. And I thought, they got, at some point I've got to accept responsibility for what comes out of the end of my fingers. And I went to her and I said this, which meant basically I was not going to be going back and doing any television for a while, which meant you know, starved to death, guys, and she just hugged me. <laughs> I'm not used to that. I'm not used to. What do you mean? <laughs> I mean? That's the only line. What do you mean you're going to stop doing this or stop doing that? And I get that kind of support from her. So the one of the things we try and do without even really saying is we try and honor the human being in each other. She is, she, one of her favorite sayings about me is I always get to where it is she wants me to go. It's just the route I take. <laughs> that amazes her sometimes. Yeah. Well, you know, I should say elaborate on that very briefly. What happens is, for instance, if I'll go to Bob with some complaint, which I have thought about a great deal so that it's a, an ironclad case, <laughs> and he can't see where I put the strings in and stuff, and um, so I'll go and say, you blah, 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 blah. He will then argue with me. Uh, in a way that w could be quite frightening. I mean, he's determined, and he is going to be right. And early on, I learned I don't have to make him say he's not right or anything else. I mean, I do. I got that much. So uh, with that simple tool in hand, I leave him alone. And what I learned is that next day or so, he'll come back and say, I got it, you know, or he'll do it, or it's changed. But I, I learned that it's not my job in a relationship to force him to the line and say, yes, Master, I'll obey you forever. I mean, that's, that's what I, I, I thought you were supposed to do, is get the other person to agree with what you said and then do it. And um, we, don't, we don't do that. But we come to, we listen, we can, I guess somehow or other, then we can hear each other, because he's not going to drag me over and make me sign on the line that he's right. So that's an old Al-Anon thing, you know, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And a, a valuable one, valuable one. And, uh, and I still get defensive, so sometimes she'll say things uh -huh. to me, <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm still coming off old stuff. And so my uh. immediate reaction is, is although I don't verbalize "fuck you," that's my immediate reaction. And and I get very solidly defensive, and I defend my position or my stand. Very well. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and and so and, and there's no sense getting in that with me because I'm not even there myself. You know, I'm into I'm into my history. She called me once, and I called her from Chicago <laughs> or somewhere, and I said, how are you? She said, right now I'd like to kill our kid. <laughs> and I said, Jesus, you know, I mean, and I started telling her, what, I was, and I got really angry with her on the phone. <laughs> and she said, what's, what's with you? And I said, well, what I'm hearing is, forget the goddamn workshop, get on the plane, come home and fix this. And she said, that's not what I said. I just said at the moment I'd like to kill the kid. I'll get through this, we'll all be fine, and you can stay in Chicago. And that's another little, you know, um, um, ingredient in relationships is what one person says and what the other person hears. Oh. That's not what she said. She did not say, get on the airplane, come home and take care of this child. Not, none of those words exited her mouth. 
but that's what I heard. I needed to be, a, to, to I, at this is what I said, I need to be able to talk to you like you're my friend. I gotta just like pull out the stops and say, I wanna kill this little son of a bitch. Because then I don't have to say it to her. There are times when the tension just builds up and it, I gotta let it off and then I can deal with the child on a, on a kind or humane level without coming out with this stuff that runs through my head all the time. <laughs> you can imagine what we would be capable of saying if we just pulled out the stops. <laughs> I'm curious, you both talked about doing some therapy. Do you still do some now? Or do you feel like your communication is kind of I go when needed. Yeah, I, I, I would go, uh, I haven't been in a while, I probably haven't been in a year or so, but I know a therapist who I love, uh, is a good friend of mine, I would go in a heartbeat Me if too. I felt I needed to. I went right after her mom died because I was really angry about, you know, a lot of stuff that went on when she was there, but I, you know, she had a right not to be abused with it, she was dying, and um, so I went t twice to a, like a, an anger expert, if there is such a thing, and cleaned it all out, and it was real good. So for now, it's, it's more like on a, as, I, as we need it. But our commitment, we are not committed to each other forever and ever until death do us, do us part. That's not our commitment. That's not the one we made when we got married. Our commitment to each other is that we will not throw this away without seeking all available help first. That's it. That's our commitment. We will not throw away this relationship without first seeking all available help. And that's the end of our commitment. Well, so if we got in trouble, we would be immediately getting outside professional help. We, we also said if the other person says, you got to go get some help, that we go get the help. Yeah. That we don't like say, no, you don't, you need it. You go, you yeah. go get some help. And that did happen at that, at that passage after my mother died. But we, pre we keep very current, as you can probably guess. But what will, what will happen for me is I'll know I'm going into a growth period doesn't have anything to do with him and then I sometimes I want a therapist to kind of midwife me through because I do some very deep and strange work in my plumbing and uh, once in a while I like to have somebody come along hold the matches for me I mean I can do a lot of it myself now you learn to do a lot of your own self healing but um, but periodically to have a companion on the journey is very beautiful I'd say our communication is it's good. The other thing too is being able to support each other in getting therapy because oftentimes one of the problems with codependency in, in our nature is that I will view anything that you do for your benefit as a, as a threat to the relationship. So you come in and say to me you're going to go get therapy and I immediately don't want you to go because to me that's the end of the relationship. That's how I see it. That's again the difference between hearing what's being said and really hearing what's, you know, and hearing what's my, my history. And that's not uncommon at all among those of us who've had those kind of childhoods that weren't nurturing. We view somebody else doing something for their own benefit as a threat to the relationship. And then nothing, of course, could be farther from the truth. But assuming that we're also taking you know, steps down our own path to do things for our own benefit. The healthiest thing two people can do in a relationship is do those things that, that make them grow and, 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 and enrich them and nourish them. And, and I have to watch a wife who's better about some of that stuff than I am. She's much better about finding a network to nurture her. And when we were in this town, we could not find one living human being to talk to that was humane. <laughs> she found a group of people that met every Saturday that were waiting for the flying saucers to return <laughs> to town. I wouldn't talk to them, you know, on the street. <laughs> but but she, can go, she can go get this. And she can give herself over to the beauty that she needs quicker than I can. We went up to see the Aspens when they mm. were changing. And I mean in... 90 seconds, Tina's picking the leaves up and holding them and feeling them and putting them on her face and she's getting this beauty. And I gotta have to walk about a mile here, you know? What I mean? I mean, it's just who, it's the difference of who I am and how I am in her. She can com completely give herself over to this nurturing and I have to just kind of come real easy into it. I don't just give myself over to it. And I noticed the thing that was very interesting about our daughter when we were on this Aspen walk. I'm walking up the road this way. Tina's making a little side turn here to get these leaves and put them on her face and stuff. And my uh, and our daughter is immediately drawn away from me to Tina, where this open, you know, hunger and ability to nurture me because she can't. She can sit down in the mud and you know feel and do <laughs> all that. So she immediately goes just from me to mom because mom's right there in that moment. Now, Mom had to go away in about a half hour, and, and, and now, by now, we're up by a stream, and I have let myself into the beauty, 
And, and my daughter and I are side by side by the stream, floating leaves, you know, aspen leaves down it. And she couldn't be happier, and she's close and against her dad. But there was a moment where mom was at it quicker, and she was into it faster. And I don't have to ever get to it as fast as she does, and I don't want her to ever slow down getting it. It's, it's, it's part of honoring your partner. You know, they aren't going to be the same, and they're not going to get the stuff the same, man. And that's the beauty of the relationship. But I get there. I get there, and she, you know, and there's other things I get quicker, and then she gets there, you know, and that's part of it. Um, I wanted to answer a question nobody asked. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, um, um, I always wondered what happens after you're with somebody for a while. I mean, is there something good or do you just get bored? Is that it? And you sort of fill in with other things and people and activities. And um, we have a lot of other people and activities in our lives, that's, that's for sure. But um, I want to say this. There was a woman that I met in this god-awful town, and um, I had a dream about her. She had a health food store. She was a psychiatric nurse, and I needed a therapist, and there wasn't one there. And I had a dream that I asked her to do therapy with me, and would she trade for painting lessons? So I called her up, and she said yes. And you would never guess that this woman would be such a gifted therapist, looking at her from the outside or the circumstances of her life. But the chemistry between us was incredible, both ways. And uh, and I loved it that she was brave enough to do stuff back with me instead of be the therapist. And um, she said to me, she'd been with her husband for a long time, and she said, you know what happens after a long time is that you enter into this deep sea of love. What words? What words those were? And I thought, that was the first time I had anybody say something positive. I mean, so it was usually like, that son of a bitch. And, and all this stuff, but nobody said the words, the right words. And I thought, what a concept that would be to construct such a soup. And time has gone by, and all these different things have happened to us, and with us, and to us, around us. And, um, and I would say that this is what has resulted. And it's not a dull or dead or boring thing, and it's very alive, and we still love to jump on each other. I mean, that's what we're here for. There's a free hotel room. We're right there, baby. <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> Find somebody to take care of the kid. That's a beautiful thing, you know. And um, <laughs> and um, and I would say that uh, my mother, in her and my father's confusion, had her point of view, which was very powerful too. Which is, she said, he became my best friend. Now I, we have a lot of friends that we are very, very, very close with as well. But there's no question in my mind that this is my best friend. Yeah. Um, mm. And I don't mind that he has others, and I love them just the same. I don't feel like they're a threat to our friendship. They just pile on more. Yeah. The more we give away, the more we have had between us. And I think that we are quite lucky that we got called to live this kind of life. Quite an extraordinary thing. So, for those of you who ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And it's uh, 4.30. We're done. Thank you very much. Thank you.